Welcome back to 12 Days in March. I hope you had a nice break. In this video, we'll complete the heart failure series, finishing up with restrictive cardiomyopathy and its overlap with diastolic heart failure. So unlike the genetic disorders previously reviewed, restrictive cardiomyopathy, that is, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, with an emphasis on preserved ejection fraction, is a disorder that suffers from an attitude problem. Well, it isn't really an attitude problem, but if the ejection fraction is preserved, why the hell is it causing heart failure? Hopefully, we'll sort out this apparent paradox during this presentation. To be sure, since we do such a good job with heart attack prevention, I am seeing way more diastolic than systolic heart failure in my practice these days. So you are best off thinking about restrictive cardiomyopathy as a physiologic disorder. In combination with diastolic dysfunction, it is characterized by a narrow set of hemodynamic parameters. This is less about the disease and pathology and more about a small number of conditions that share a common set of pathophysiologic derivatives. So what's the problem? In practical terms, restrictive heart disease, from all causes, can be described as an inability to fill the left ventricle at normal filling pressures. The left ventricle is too stiff to permit admission. Once you understand the problem, the rest makes sense. And here are those pressures. The left graphic reminds us about the normal, low, left ventricular, and diastolic pressure. The right image demonstrates the thick, stiff ventricle. It will fill during atrial systole, as we do need to maintain cardiac output, but it does so under higher pressures, which is fine until the atrium can't keep up and congestive heart failure results. Same idea, little arrow filling the left ventricle at low filling pressures. A big arrow filling the left ventricle at high filling pressures is noted on the right. So here's the damage. This is what and how they will come after you for restrictive heart disease. The left ventricle and diastolic volume is essentially normal. To maintain cardiac output, the blood is forced under high pressure into the left ventricle. The ejection fraction is normal. That makes sense. The pump works. It's just stiff. Remember, we are talking about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The main test derivative is the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. It is elevated. In the remainder of this video, we'll explore the different methods and language they use to come after you on the NBME, as well as a brief review of the specific conditions you should be familiar with. So to compare and contrast, we can recognize dilated cardiomyopathy as a pumping problem characterized by poor contractility. Restrictive cardiomyopathy describes the inability to fill the left ventricle at normal pressures. We've already made that point. And remember, the presence of a cardiomyopathy is not synonymous with congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is characterized by venous congestion in the form of pulmonary rolls. We consider these patients decompensated. And look what rears its head again, the compliance curve. They will present a patient with a footprint of restrictive heart disease and ask you to identify the correct curve. Unlike dilated cardiomyopathy, now we are looking for the thick, stiff, poorly compliant, or poorly distensible curve. It will be the curve illustrating higher pressures compared with normal for any volume of blood shown on the y-axis. So curve B is the curve seen in restrictive heart disease. I'm not sure that you picked up on my phraseology of restrictive heart disease. Although we are reviewing restrictive cardiomyopathy, I feel that that term is too, well, restrictive. The physiologic principles are the same ones used in discussion of diastolic heart failure. There are subtle distinctions between restrictive cardiomyopathy and diastolic heart failure, but these are not germane to the step one examination. So let's continue our discussion focusing on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. I reiterate the common pathology as the inability of the left ventricle to fill at normal pressures. Here's the same compliance curve, but this time showing the left ventricular diastolic pressures on the y-axis. Let's first look at the control or normal curve. As we trace the increasing volumes along the x-axis, we see a relatively low left ventricular and diastolic pressure, as one would expect. There is hardly any elevation in the pressure going from 40 to 100 mLs in this graphic. But now look at the patient with diastolic heart failure. Using 80 mLs as an example, look at the difference in end diastolic pressure. For the same volume of blood, the patient with diastolic dysfunction has an intraventricular pressure of twice normal. Do note the end diastolic volume is ultimately achieved, but at the cost of high filling pressures. Here is just another visual representation of what that damn restricted ventricle is thinking. Somehow, under elevated pressures, it will accommodate the necessary volume, but with the outer dimensions remaining almost unchanged. It's like talking without moving your lips. But here is the money for the last time. The parameters apply to both diastolic dysfunction and restrictive cardiomyopathy. You need to know ejection fraction, 
left ventricular end diastolic volume, and left ventricular end diastolic pressure. The EF is normal as the pump is in good repair. The end diastolic volume is more or less normal, albeit at a higher pressure. And the big ticket item is the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. Got that? End diastolic pressure, which is elevated. Hey, look what I found. Did you think I would forget about the pressure volume loop? We don't want to miss this doozy. Not a lot of action here, and based on our discussion, the tracing is totally predictable. The volume is basically okay. The stroke volume is preserved, but look at the damn elevated left ventricular pressure. So let's finish up with the disorders. No need to beat these to death. The first three disorders focus on the endocardium with names reflecting the pathology. Endomyocardial fibrosis is identified by fibrosis of the endocardium. If you add some eosinophils, the entity is referred to as Loeffler's endomyocarditis. Remember that Loeffler's research was in the field of parasites, so all his eponyms are associated with eosinophils. But let's cut to the chase. Although sarcoid can cause restrictive cardiomyopathy, that disorder is generally focused around pulmonary pathology. The prototypic disorder presenting with restrictive cardiomyopathy is amyloidosis with a focus on cardiac amyloid as opposed to systemic amyloidosis. So what do you need to know? First, the questions are generally pretty blunt, as in, a cardiac biopsy stains positive with Congo red stain showing apple green birefringence under polarized lens. That's pretty classic. But you should also be familiar with the description of amyloid as an infiltrated disorder characterized by eosinophilic deposits. That is not eosinophilia, rather the color is described as eosinophilic. I am sure they use that description to confuse you. So it is this infiltrative process which causes the heart to stiffen. You should also be familiar with the following. Nodules resembling drops of wax may be described on the endocardial surface. Wax indeed. So now, dear kind people, can you tell me the protein that constitutes or is found in those drops of wax? Bingo! Transthyretin. Remember, amyloid deposits represent aggregation of proteins. You need to be familiar with which amyloid protein deposits where. For instance, you'll remember in our discussion of medullary thyroid carcinoma, the protein sheets are composed of calcitonin. In the heart, you need to know that the protein is transthyretin. And this is really it for the pathology of restrictive cardiomyopathy. I will stick in one dangling thought since you might have to distinguish cardiac amyloid as a prototypic restrictive cardiomyopathy from constrictive pericarditis which has similar hemodynamic parameters. If they present a patient with constrictive pericarditis, you will be able to identify them by the presence of pericardial knock and Kuzmol sign. There will be a predisposing demographic which is invariably radiation therapy in the remote past. And most importantly, there will be no evidence of a multi-system disorder. Restrictive heart disease, on the other hand, is likely to be related to amyloid. JVD will be described, and interestingly, restrictive cardiomyopathy may also have Kuzmol sign. The amyloid patient is highly likely to be presented as a multi-system disorder, at which point you'll need to consider the other amyloid proteins, such as AL associated with myeloma, or serum amyloid A associated with chronic inflammatory disease. And that will do it. So now let's bring this discussion home. You need to be familiar with the compliance patterns of both dilated cardiomyopathy and restrictive cardiomyopathy. This curve isn't going away. You need to recognize the pressure volume loops, as in, you must have these down cold. And finally, the tables. Dilated cardiomyopathy will have high volumes, decreased ejection fraction and cardiac output, and high total peripheral resistance and venous return related to sympathetic nervous system activation. If a sound is included in the vignette, it will be an S3. Compare that to restrictive heart disease, including diastolic dysfunction. End diastolic volume is normal, the pressure is high, and if a sound is included, it will be an S4 related to the poorly compliant ventricle. And that's what I got for you. Dilated cardiomyopathy is the prototype for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and restrictive heart disease is the prototype for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. There are a limited number of ways that can come after you with these physiologic states. I suspect you'll make easy work of these disorders come test day. If you have any questions about any of this junk, please drop me a line at 12 days. Great catching up with you today.